Barbara Koenig, unknown to many of you, is a professor of medical anthropology and bioethics at the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Institute of Health and Aging at UCSF. Um, she has pioneered the use of empirical social science methods in the study of ethical questions in science, medicine, and health, and she is uh, another of the three PIs on the project that brings us here today. Carmen Radecki Breitkopf is Associate Professor of Health Sciences Research at the Mayo Clinic. Her research focuses on understanding and reducing disparities in health that may result from factors such as sociodemographics, Eng English language proficiency, and cultural beliefs about health and disease, with a particular focus on psychological and behavioral aspects of cancer prevention among minority and vulnerable populations. Uh, and she is also a member of our project, uh, deeply involved in the empirical components. Thanks, Susan. That was a fabulous presentation of our, uh, pre uh, of our project to date. Um, Carmen and I are going to co-present this uh, talk, and I'm actually going to start a little timer here to try and get you out of time, uh, in time quickly for your break. So we're now going to turn to um, another part of the project. So you just heard the discussion of our AIM-2, which is our normative analysis and legal analysis of these issues having to do with family. Um, and now we're going to uh, go back to what was our first aim, which was to assess a priori preferences of pancreatic cancer patients, or probands, they're often called in research, their family members, and healthy controls about receiving genomic results that carry health and or reproductive risks using, and this is a two-part assessment of preferences, in-depth qualitative interviews and a structured survey. So we're going to tell you about both of those uh, today. Um, and I want, but I want to start out with a warning. Um, and this, this has to do with all, all of the issues of how you combine in a single project empirical work about preferences as well as normative analysis. Data do not equal policy. Just looking at what people prefer and want doesn't limit, doesn't lead to, to policy itself. So this has to be a, a complicated... Um, yes, you can. <laughs> And here's another slide from Wiley Burke, actually, who opened the conference. Um, if you think about the different ways in which uh, data can contribute to policy, and she's enumerated four in some previous work, it could suggest the need, data could suggest the need for new or revised policy. It could, it could um, help you assess whether policy goals are actually accomplished uh, at some point in the policy process, identify unanticipated outcomes, or assess whether policies or underlying assumptions are acceptable to stakeholders. So those are some legitimate uh, goals, uh, things that you can use data for. And I'm the data person, I'm not, I'm not the lawyer. Um, I'm now going to turn it over because we want to make sure you know there was a real health and social psychologist involved <laughs> in writing this, push that one, in, so. in, in doing the survey. She's going to tell you about our methods. Okay, so this is a privilege to talk about our methods. They were um, rigorous and should convince you to um, believe in the data that we're going to share today. So the development of the survey, uh, the content of it was guided by the interview portion of this research in which 51 in-depth qualitative interviews were conducted, and I performed some of those interviews myself. And we also had consultation with pancreatic cancer advocates called the Rapport Group, uh, who've been working with Dr. Gloria Peterson's um, research team for a number of years. The format of the survey was guided by iterative pilot testing. We developed a survey, we tested it, we gave it to a number of individuals and got that feedback, revised it, and tested it again. The distribution of the survey was that we mailed it to 6,137 individuals in the pancreatic cancer biospecimen resource, also the family registry affiliated with that work, and unaffected controls. And the unaffected controls were patients that came to Mayo Clinic for a general medical exam. They were frequency matched with the pancreatic cancer registry folks by um, sex, age group, and race ethnicity, which was um, homogeneous, and residence. 
The waves of survey distribution began in July of 2013. We had two follow-up mailings to those who didn't respond, and the last wave was mailed at the end of October in 2013. The data were handled by Dr. Gloria Peterson's extremely competent team. They were double-entered. We had team adjudic adjudication to clean and recover missing data that occurred in the survey responses, although I'll point out that for many of the questions, the missing data were minimal, 1 to 3 percent, and I think that is due to the rigor of the development of the survey. So who did we hear from? We heard from 3,630 respondents, which is a response rate of 59.1 percent, which is um, very uh, reassuring. Uh, the, the survey composition is in the pie chart. Uh, 47% controls, 13% probands are affected, 29% relatives, and 11% spouse make up the sample. Who declined our survey? This shows you who accepted, but who declined um, were folks that responded no to the mailing, an active no. Um, it was about 6% among probands and went to a high of 10% among controls that actively declined. Survey non-responders, so we sent two mailings, but we never heard anything from them, was about 12% among probands and ranging to 50% among controls, which I'd expect. Oops. The respondent demographics were largely female, white, non-Hispanic, married, educated, covered by health insurance. We had less than a quarter that agreed with the statement pancreatic cancer runs in the family. And that's important because we don't want to present these data as biased toward the issue of pancreatic cancer. Indeed, it was not. The mean age of the sample was 66, median 67, with a full range of 23 to 99 years, with the relative group um, being significantly younger than the other groups. And the last slide I'll cover is basically, this was a sample of people that largely expected to learn something about their results as participants in research. And among those who expected to learn, 99% expected they would be told if something bad was found, and 85% expected to be told if something good was found. So you'll see this, is, this reflects uh, this emerging change that we see in terms of the whole return of results uh, debate generally. I'm now going to tell you, um, let's see, no, I haven't, we haven't done this one. So um, the other interesting thing that the respondents told us is that very, very few said that they would never want results. So the item on the survey was actually, I would never want to be offered genetic research results from my sample or a family member's sample. And only 1.8% overall uh, endorsed that. So if you can see, the way these slides are all going to be set up is that you'll have all respondents here and then the probands or affected uh, individuals, um, blood relatives, spouses who are social family members, and controls. So again, a very small number. Um, and, and this is from the interviews now suggesting what that sounds like. So this was a very rare uh, response. And someone said, worry is the worst disease. I want to focus on what I know, not what I don't know. Let's not borrow trouble from the future. I can rely on medical experts and friends. I don't need to know everything. Okay, and Susan always reminds me that the minority views are very important and we are one of the reasons that we have exceptions is to protect the minority views. So important to know that they're there, but they're pretty, the, the people who really um, are totally concerned are very much in a small number, which perhaps suggests uh, a, issues for how our defaults are set. Um, also our sample, I think the one way in which it is perhaps somewhat biased, if we want to use that word, is that 75% of the sample endorsed the, the idea that genetic knowledge is power. So this was really a very genetically optimistic group, not surprising perhaps because of uh, how they were selected. Um, let me tell you just a quick a bit about the interview study. This was drawn from two Mayo Clinic pancreas cancer registries, um, one familial and one more with sporadic cases. Uh, as Carmen mentioned, 51 in-depth semi-structured phone interviews were uh, completed. Again, we had a high participation rate. 33% uh, of those contacted agreed to, to help us out. Um, and the categories were the same as what we've just described in the 
uh, in the survey, but except that we didn't uh, interview any controls. Um, all we, we interviewed only individuals from the cancer registries, um, and that's because this whole project developed because in Gloria Peterson's work uh, at Mayo, she discovered in her pancreas registry individuals who had very significant and serious incidental findings or what uh, came to be called incidental or secondary findings of things like uh, BRCA2. So that was what really motivated the whole study. And again, 27 female, 24 male, and mean age is the age of people who tend to get uh, sick in America and have cancer, which is the reason for the, the age being what it is. Okay, so the way this whole talk is going to be set up is to think about, on the one hand, and this is a lot of alliteration, all of the P's that we have to think about, policy, whoops, policy practices and procedures pr based on principles, and in some cases law, on the one hand, versus or vis-a-vis -vis participant preferences. And in some cases, what we find is concordance between what people uh, endorse in their preferences, and in some cases, we find discordance. I'm going to primarily emphasize today discordance, but some things that have already come up, like the issue of the, the delight in choice, which is deeply American, we also saw that. So that there was a lot of concordance in those kinds of issues. But uh, I'm going to focus more, more on the discordance today just because I think it gives us more, uh, it will help more in shaping our report. So on the issue of privacy and control, which is one of the major domains that we've already talked about, so where we are in that in terms of policy is that it's been very individually individualistically focused, individual maintains control while they're alive, there's this, this basic assumption of confidentiality in the clinic, uh, there's common rule uh, protection which emphasizes the confidentiality for research participants before death, um, <clears throat> the common rule does not extend after death, and then there's also HIPAA, and I guess I'm more, I'm one of those people who finds HIPAA to be a prison, uh, but uh, nonetheless, so, so HIPAA though is clearly, and now it's a prison that extends to 50 years, um, and it definitely extends after death. So that's the current situation. So what, what does our data show us about how people might react to this? I need to tell you about a vignette that we developed in the interviews and then used in the survey because we found that people were more able to talk about this if we had a concrete example to talk through. So we came up with the idea of PAT, specifically gender neutral, so that people could identify who, whether, whether they wanted to be a male PAT, a female PAT. PAT's 58 years old, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2009. PAT has a spouse and two biologically related children, a daughter age 22 and a son age 24. Pat volunteered to participate, and this is the name of Gloria's database, and Pat completed questionnaires and gave a blood sample. In 2010, researchers discovered a new gene that is related to pancreatic, pancreatic cancer risk. This new gene was present in the blood sample uh, Pat provided. Since genes run in families, Pat's blood relatives might also have the new gene. At the time of the discovery, there were no proven ways to prevent the development of pancreatic cancer in people who have the gene. So basically what we did, we set up this scenario, and then we went through different kinds of examples. You know, the, this is the, the purpose of the study, was the pancreatic cancer. And then there were three other kinds of fam findings that we talked through. A, a breast cancer susceptibility gene and cystic fibrosis. I don't have time to go through all of the data today. I'm going to focus just on the specific example of breast cancer. So they had the basic scenario, and then they asked a whole bunch of questions about whether they about the issues of sharing with family. Um, so this was the second part. As the researchers continued to look for genetic causes of pancreatic cancer, they discovered that some patients in the registry also have mutations in genes that may cause in, uh, in, increased risk for other diseases. In 2012, researchers found a mutation in a gene called BRCA2 in Pat's original blood, blood sample. So it's getting this idea that over time, research progresses, more things are found. And again, since genes run in families, I won't go through that. We actually, Professor Burke, Burke actually earlier showed a, a pedigree of a typical example showing how you have obligate car carriers. I'm sure most of you know that. So let me just quickly move to the data um, so that you can uh, take a look. Whoops, I went in the wrong direction. So you can't look in the at the data. Okay, so here is, um, here is the, a summary of the data, and you'll see above the line, these are um, w uh, 
examples of what the participants thought if Pat was still alive, meaning the proband is still alive, as opposed to when the proband is deceased. And I'm going to go through these because they're extremely interesting. So the first is, Pat should be able to keep information about the BRCA2 mutation private from others in the family. Okay, Only a third endorsed that, 32.3%, even while the Pat is alive. Researchers should only offer Pat's information about the BRCA2 mutation to blood relatives if Pat has given explicit permission to share genetic results. And people do endorse that. 60% like the idea of having Pat uh, give permission, but that changes somewhat. It's going to slip, flip somewhat. You'll see what happens when Pat is deceased. So if a new if a new discovery is made after Pat's death, the information about the BRCA2 mutation should be offered to Pat's spouse. People are happy to share with the spouse, so that is okay. If Pat's spouse refuses the offer of information about BRCA2 mutation, researchers should offer the results to Pat's children. So they think that, that um, if, Pat's re if Pat's spouse doesn't want to make it, this would be the typical HIPAA personal representative that and they think that should be overridden, which is very, very interesting, that it should still be offered directly to the children. And if the new discovery is made after Pat's death and Pat's wishes about sharing genetic information are unknown, the information about the BRCA2 mutation should be offered to Pat's um, blood relatives. That's 86.1% if his wishes are unknown. And then finally, this is the really interesting one, if the discovery... If Pat previously said no to sharing genetic information, the, the information should not be offered. So we, because we, in, in good survey methods way, since Carmen was helping, was, was designing this, we asked things both in the negative and the positive way. And here you'll see that 70% uh, really think that, you, uh, think that you should offer the information even if Pat has said no, which I think is very high. So 30% say the opposite. So very, very interesting data. I'll give you a few more data here about um, the issue of sharing within family. The PAT scenario allowed people to think about these issues in the third person, about someone else. We also had a long part of the interview in the survey where we asked people to get to talk about what it might mean for themselves. And again, um, just three points here. Uh, why do people think this, and how, are they, how do they feel about it asked about them when they are asked themselves? So I'm going to be right here. Genetic information belongs to all blood relatives, not just the person who gave the blood sample. So people see, the, feel, see these things in a very different way than what the laws and policy seem to supply. So 60% of people that endorse the idea that it belongs to the whole family. Um, the second point, I would feel obligated to share my genetic research results with my blood relatives. 85% feel this obligation to share. I would be okay with sharing my, blood rel my genetic results with the blood relatives who wanted to know them. And even if, if you move to the situation where the, the person actually is interested in getting the results, it, the numbers even go up. Um, you'll see that there are a lot of, uh, many of the p-values, uh, in, the, in making comparisons between probands, biological relatives, um, and non-biological relatives are significant. That's partly just because our sample is so big. I'm not going to be talking about those today um, because they're, they're I, I think, not as interesting as some of the overall findings. Okay. All right. Uh, another um, important thing is... It, or to emphasize this issue, here are some quotes from the interviews about what it sounds like when people are talking about this idea that genetic information is something that's shared rather than something that's purely a feature of an individual, even though, of course, it can only be known in an individual. So our interview subjects said things like, the next of kin genetic tree should be notified. I think it is their genetic right to know. Immediate family members have a right to know the genetic code isn't just his, it is also mine, which I think is, is very interesting that it's something that's uh, shared within the family. Um, and uh, to continue, um, I would not want my blood relatives to know about my genetic research results. Only 8.9% of people endorse the idea that, that, that there should be um, uh, this privacy within the family issue. They're a fairly low number, and I would want my genetic results to be kept private even after my death, 
this is pretty key to this whole debate, only 5.3% of individuals endorsed that. So these are pretty striking findings. Um, and to give you a few quotes about this issue of whether privacy ends with death, people were, people were sort of, we kept pushing on that and saying, well, don't you think certain things should be private? And they would give examples of things they thought, but it wasn't genetic information. So certainly they understood that, you know, you had an abortion when you were 16, you may not want that passed on to your family, but they found genetic information to be different. Um, so once you're dead, and they thought, once you're dead, you have no rights. Of course, I'm sure the lawyers in the room don't agree with I mean, I certainly don't agree with that either, but um, that's the most extreme. And why do people think that? Well, it's partly because of this issue that sharing is, is obligatory. After death, a family should be entitled to the information. If they inherited the gene, they ought to inherit the data. Um, also, and this, um, this is a fairly complicated slide, we basically ask people who they would be concerned to share their data with. And most of the items over here, this, there's, if you draw a line right here, you see the family, within the family is over there, and everyone, other issues are over here. So employer, health insurance company, long-term care, disability, because we also talked a little bit about Gina in the, in the surveys and in the interview. But you'll see that people have, are, have, are not at all concerned or slightly concerned about sharing with, their bi with a biological family member who also they feel owns the data. So it's really the line is not, is, is, the line is not between here around the individual, separating the individual from the family, but the line is between the family and the outside world, or that's how we interpret these data. Um, and why do they do that? Well, it appears to be people really privilege this idea of benefit. So privacy and control is not as important as the potential benefit. So we ask people in a forced choice way, the most important factor to consider in returning genetic results is either on the one hand of the scale, the wishes of the person who provided the blood sample, as opposed to whether the blood will, relatives will benefit. And you'll see quite quite, I mean, not 80-20, but pretty significant uh, number of people who think that whether the relatives will benefit is the most important thing. Also, interestingly, this showed some very significant sex differences uh, with women being much more, uh, m endorsing to a much higher degree the issue of, of benefit. Okay. So um, another, I'm going to move on from thinking about privacy and control to thinking about another domain that is very important in genetics and genetic policy. One of our principles and practices based on law and procedures, et cetera, regulation. And that is the idea of protecting the right not to know. So we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and this is a practice that I think has, is, has really been key to clinical genetics and research and perhaps dates to Huntington's testing protocols. That's my own view of this. Um, and we talked a little bit about some of Ellen uh, Clayton's seminal work. It's linked to the issues of things like protecting the child's right to an open future. I'm not, I'm not going to go into as much detail as in the previous work. I'll just do one example here. So if you think of protecting the right not to know, here's a forced choice. Well, first, in the interviews, we found it very difficult to get people to talk about this. They, didn't, they kept saying, well, what do you mean the right not to know? They had a hard time uh, understanding this, so we had to give concrete examples. And it was a hard thing to talk about. But based on the interviews, we developed this question, which was a forced choice. So not offering results to, so this is a, a policy choice. So should you not offer results to anyone in order to, in research, in order to protect those who do not want to know? So that was the choice, as opposed to offer results to all, even at the risk of upsetting some. And the reason people tended to endorse the, at, by 86.5%, the idea of offering, uh, even at the risk of upsetting some, is because people really did believe in choice, and they were pretty clear that it was okay for the offer, you know, you could still make the offer, and people could just say no, and no, I don't want that, and so they, they, and they didn't find that to be problematic. Um, so offering is important. 20.8% agreed that people who do not want to know their research results should not participate in research studies. There's no need to protect them from the offer. Um, so uh, an important issue. 
Um, and finally, or one of the last points I want to make is about the issue that we've talked about already of the importance of this idea of actionability. Um, and in the policy world, the current professional recommendations for things like uh, about which findings that we, that we could offer, such as the uh, American College of Medical Genetics guidelines, that focus on technical validity and clinical utility, particularly actionability. What we found with our participants is that the, this absolute primacy of actionability was generally not endorsed. Certainly they did endorse actionability. Um, I have two slides that are in this format. We asked people to, to rate a whole list of things. How important of this is this in your decision about whether something should be offered to family? Um, and, the fir and, and then they had a three-part way that they were supposed to uh, respond. It definitely should not be offered, so that's the red, that's the key. You can't see the difference here very much between the yellow and the green, but the key is the red. Could be offered, so it's in the middle range of allowable, and definitely should be offered, so the should is over here. Okay, and here's the actionability, so you'll see that v almost everyone endorses the actionability. But they will make, but they are very sensitive to the issue, the other policy issues of it, if it's still not understood. But some of the other things that we tend to be a bit more protective of, like whether it, you know, whether it can be, whether there's only a small chance, whether it's fatal, whether it's passed on to children. And also, we found this very interesting. People really had very little interest, had little interest or less interest in the issue of whether a federal regulatory body had approved it, which we found interesting given how much space and time we spend thinking about this. And, and also even, I mean, there is a somewhat less uh, idea of, of having information about things that are related to cognitive decline. Okay, um, the final point that I'm going to make is, um, oh, okay, is the research, is thinking about the research clinical care divide, which we're going to have a, se a session on this afternoon, but just to sort of uh, move a little bit forward on that. Um, and that, of course, you know, th drawing a very firm line has been something that is a main way that we protect participants in research and in innovation, et cetera. So I'm going to show you one set of findings on that issue. And this is about really the issue of who is responsible for initiating return. And it's a two-part question. Um, is, is it the research participants' responsibility to ask to get information, key to this issue of passive versus active, or is it the researchers', researchers responsibility to offer? And that's on the red bars. And you'll see overall, the overall response is that 76.7% .7 think that it really is the research participants' responsibility to offer um, findings, and this, this was done in the context of actionable of researchers. researchers, yes. It was the researchers' uh, responsibility to, um, to offer, not the subject's part, uh, oper uh, obligation to, uh, to ask. And even more interesting, in, down in these two small bars, the first line is researchers should not be required to offer genetic research results because it's not their job. So this is flipping it and asking it in the negative. Only 12.9% endorse that. So they didn't like the idea that these researchers would say, it's just not my job to do that. I know something important about you, but I don't know it. Um, and then we actually, our timer says three minutes, but so I'm gonna argue a little bit because we were a little over. Um, no, no, no matter. Sorry, no matter how much money um, it costs, researchers should offer results to research participants. And two-thirds thought that, you know, don't tell me it costs too much. You know something about me. And this may suggest something about an important issue in trust that we need to at least pay, a, uh, pay a, some mind to. I mean, yes, privacy is important, but other things are important as well. Okay, I have just two slides left. So back to uh, Dr. Burke's slide about the potential potential contributions of data to policy. I would argue that some of our data, and you, you've only heard just a really quick snapshot of it, actually do suggest some need for a new or revised policy. Maybe there are certain issues uh, in the HIPAA prison that we need to think about. 
Um, and we also might be able to as uh, assess whether policies are actually acceptable to stakeholders. That may be something to do in the future. The next steps in our own project, as Susan began to mention, are first we use the, we're going to use the interview data and the survey results to actually inform uh, an offer of results experiment, which our group is about to undertake using the, this, these Mayo Clinic pancreatic cancer biobanks. So stay tuned for the results of that. And then following the analysis and the completion of our normative work, uh, we also will try and develop some best practices for family return. That's our aim for. And again, I would argue that, whoops, that including, whoops, including consideration of a reset of current defaults regarding family return. I think, I think we have to at least really put on the table the issue that some of our defaults may, be not, uh, may, may not reflect preferences of individuals. And finally, this survey took a huge team of people to put together and do the interview. So I wanted to thank everyone on the team, and especially um, our um, our uh, patient advocates in a group called Rapport, and all the people who uh, were agreed to fill out our very long survey and be interviewed. So thanks very much.